I will introduce our first section, which is a keynote speaker from the States. He is also the chair of our graduate consortium, Professor Carlos Tassira. Professor Carlos Tassira is a Charles Owen Professor of Design, Institute of Design, IIT. His expertise are design strategy, open innovation, and sustainable solutions. He is, he actually did, he also teach graduate course and advise top doctorate students on the strategic use of design capabilities in complex innovation space. Carlos' research interest in including the era of design strategy, open innovation, and sustainable solution. He is also the faculty director of the Action Lab. So, Carlos, are you online now? Yes. Okay. Hello. Great. Good so, morning for everybody there. Yes. Yeah, so now the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And um, I am um, great to be here. And I want to uh, uh, thank everybody for the invitation and also for the opportunity to chair the graduate consortium and be also the keynote speaker over here. Um, just um, uh, to add a little bit to the introduction, I'm Carlos Teixeira and I, um, uh, I have a PhD in design from the Institute of Design. I originally from Brazil and I came to the United States to do my PhD. After uh, finishing my PhD at ID at the Institute of Design in Chicago, I went to Parsons. I was uh, for about 12 years at Parsons School of Design in New York. And then um, in the last six years, I moved back to the Institute of Design now as a faculty member and also as the uh, director of the PhD program. And now we also created the Action Lab. is is a lab for a design practice in the areas of sustainable solutions. And we and now I'm the director uh, just starting this new lab at the Institute of Design. So um, today I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, what what it means to have a PhD in design. I'm going to start sharing my screen. But I'm going to be talking from my experience as the um, as, as someone that graduated uh, in the PhD in design, as well as someone that is uh, directing the PhD program in the past um, uh, six years. So let me talk. Um, let me share my screen now. Just making sure that you can see the screen. Yes, um, it's over there. So. Um, the main uh, focus of my presentation today is to um, try to address the, this question about what it means to have a PhD in design. So uh, pay attention that the question is not necessarily about what it, take, uh, what, it, um, what it means to do a PhD in design. It's what happens once you take a PhD in design. So let's elaborate a little bit on, on that notion of um, what can you do with a PhD in design. My, my first point is that um, the traditional way that a PhD degree is uh, seen is that you develop an authoritative expertise in a field, in a domain. So for example, uh, in design, you come from a master degree, and can be a more professionally oriented or it can be a more uh, academic oriented master's degree. But once you move to the PhD, you're developing research and uh, the main goal uh, of PhD programs is to uh, develop um, an expertise in the domain of design. So design is, is the main focus of your study and why do you um, develop your expertise. But we also have to take a look and consider that uh, the experience of doing a PhD, that can be three years, four years, five years, or, or even longer, 
um, is something that is part of your advancement of your skills. So in addition to you developing a domain expertise in the topic of design, you also develop uh, many uh, skills that uh, comes uh, from um, your all higher education. So when you do your bachelor's degree um, and you do your master's in whatever configuration, um, in Europe you have three years and then two years, um, in different countries you have different um, uh, amount of years that you develop on your bachelor's and then your master's degree. But however is the configuration, basically you are continuously developing your skills as you progress uh, through different degrees. And that's one of the areas that um, usually people don't uh, look too much, is what are the skills that you develop when you, when you go through a PhD degree? And, um, and when we take this notion of not only thinking about the specific domain that you do your PhD, but you also think about the skill set that um, you're developing, uh, you're developing uh, practice. And practice is something that um, uh, you acquire through experience, through repetition, through um, the routine of doing uh, those uh, practice. So um, the reason I'm putting the bars here, it's first to understand that this skill set that you are developing through uh, the years and through different degrees, it's cumulative. You are accumulating different um, um, uh, skills and practice through um, uh, the many years that they're developing. So while you are pursuing your expertise in the domain of design, you also having to master and then um, also become very competent in many practices and developing the skills of acquiring that expertise. So the question that I want to raise here is uh, something that most of the time, um, including myself, when we think about a PhD, uh, 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 degree and a PhD in design is uh, to look at what are the practice, what are the skills that we develop while we are developing our expertise in design. And I would um, try to highlight here uh, three main areas um, in uh, skill sets that um, is developed for anyone that does a PhD. It's, it's very hard to imagine anyone doing a PhD and not being able to develop some level of those skills. Uh, one of them is this notion of entrepreneurship. We tend to think about entrepreneurship very much from the point of view of business, from, um, from corporations, from the Silicon Valley in the United States perspective of innovation, but entrepreneurship here applies to the notion that you are an entrepreneur, you're starting something, you're developing uh, something new and you're taking uh, uh, the, the, and you're using your skill sets of being able to develop something new. So for example, uh, the entrepreneurship of you developing your own research and applying for a grant is um, a, a, a one example of how you, um, you uh, practice your entrepreneurship uh, skills. Organizing uh, field work. When you're doing PhD, you have to go and develop field work. You have to do case studies. You have to develop uh, some data collection. You have to interact with experts um, in that area. Um, so this notion of taking uh, the effort and be able to successfully uh, for uh, organizing uh, field work for your research is something that uh, builds into your entrepreneurship skills. The second one that I'm highlighting here is leadership. So for example, if you develop a network of experts, you are assuming a leadership position. You are claiming that you also are interested in that expertise and you identify other people that has similar expertise and you want to bring that collective that network together so you can elaborate um, on this um, specific discussion or this specific um, interest. So while you are working in the design field and you are building a network, you're developing 
um, a, a leadership role. Um, managing a research project, it's very common that um, you work with your advisors, with more senior researchers, but you assume uh, the management of a, a given research project. And that is a leadership role. You have to manage the budget, you have to manage uh, the team, you have to deal with uh, timeline and deliverables, you have to manage the quality. So while you might be doing a research project in design and you're developing your expertise in design, at the same time, you are also developing leadership skills. And the third one, which is the most common one that we tend to think about skill set in terms of doing a PhD, is this notion of scholarship. Um, that your ability of um, developing arguments and writing an article, so you can position your findings and uh, reference uh, to the, uh, the work of others and positioning your, uh, your work. Um, organizing a conference is an example of scholarship. You have to develop a, a topic, you have to develop research questions, you have to bring a relevant issue to be discussed. Um, so this um, organizing a conference is always um, on this uh, process of developing new knowledge in the field, and that counts as part of your scholarship. So those are examples of um, practices that as you go through a substantial and intensive uh, process of doing a PhD, if that is three years, four or five, um, you are at the same time developing these skill sets uh, of entrepreneurship, leadership, scholarship, in addition to developing the domain expertise that is expected for your graduation um, and final de thesis defense. If you think about those skill sets, uh, both in terms of domain expertise and the skills that you develop um, uh, while you're doing the PhD, I would like to highlight here two um, type of potential paths and applications of uh, your uh, of those um, developments and those learning that you acquire through a PhD. So, in terms of career paths uh, with a PhD after you after you finish, um, there are people that uh, like and enjoy um, dealing with theoretical problems. And uh, one example of a theoretical problem, and this is uh, from a recent book that I'm reading right now and I'm really enjoying, and I highly suggest people to read, um, which is The Government of Things. And this is Thomas Lemke, and he is revisiting the work of Foucault and um, looking at um, his work uh, to be able to define um, a new interpretation of materialism. So it's uh, very interesting for us to think about things for, those, for all of us that are designers and want to understand design and, and systems. Um, the notion of the government of things uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's a very interesting one. So I put here in a, a quick excerpt just to show what is a theoretical problem that uh, Thomas Lenke is working on. Um, he says that um, this work shares the interest in conceptualizing matter and the focus on the interplay of epistemological, ontological, political, and ethical issues, and insists on the limits of anthropocentric uh, a modes of thought. So this is a this is a provocation. This is a positioning, and this is um, a critical point of view, and trying to formulate a new interpretation of materialism. So that's what I'm defining here, and many, I'm not the one, um, but many uh, would consider that a theoretical problem. And um, so many people, when they develop a PhD, um, and in the case of a PhD in design, this could be a very applicable and very uh, uh, appropriate uh, career path is to develop a PhD and work on those kinds of theoretical problems. On the other hand, you can also address practical problems. And the example that I have here is from Jay Malikan, 
that, um, and this is the, uh, the problem that he was working on his PhD dissertation at the Institute of Design. His work on, was on how design teams apply user research data in creative problem solving. Um, look at the date, is that's a very interesting date, 2000. And Jay Malikan, as doing his PhD, he was bringing up this notion of um, when we are doing creative problem solving, what about bringing user research data into this process? And um, although we, we tend to think um, human-centered design today as something that always existed and we take for granted, um, around this time, this was something that was still in um, as a problem, as a challenge, or something that was an open space for exploration. And he was uh, proposing this research, and this is from his introduction, the abstract of his dissertation. Um, he says, this research was conducted to help move the design community toward a description of design problem solving activity that accounts for the productive contributions of user research data. So here you have um, two uh, potential uh, problems to explore once you take a PhD, and I'm giving very concrete examples of PhD in design. So here I want to uh, show you um, um, a framework where we can think in the following way. Think about optional career paths, career paths for a PhD in design. And um, at one axis, you have types of problems. So the types of problems that you have here that can be theoretical problems or practical problems as I described it to you. Um, but you also have the types of expertise that we were discussing and they can be the domain expertise, but they also can be the skill set of uh, entrepreneurship, leadership, scholarship that we, uh, I described it to you that you acquire as you are doing a PhD degree. So one option is for you to um, develop a more traditional academic oriented career. And that's where most of the PhD has positioned their work. And um, I'm including myself. I, I'm a, a someone that has uh, graduated from the Institute of Design and uh, decided to go for the university and had the, the fortune, the opportunity to get a position at Parsons and then now at the Institute of Design. But since my PhD, although I had a career, a professional career back in Brazil, where I came before, uh, where I was before coming to, to the United States, I, uh, my main application of the PhD has been in an academic oriented career. And this is very much based on this notion of the domain expertise in design, where you are working on theoretical problems um, and uh, on the domain of design. And, uh, uh, um, another uh, option is for us to think about a career path that um, builds on the advanced expertise in leadership entrepreneurship. So if you, if you think about the skill sets that you develop in terms of entrepreneurship, leadership, those are things that are very appropriate for positions in the industry. Industry relies and depends on individuals that can take um, those, um, that can, can apply those skill sets. So the transferability of those skills from your PhD into the industry application are very welcome and also um, very desirable by, by industry. And um, in addition to those two, every time that you're doing a PhD, I also highlighted that you're developing scholarship. Um, so ability of, of presenting an argument or positioning idea, um, organizing a conference, writing articles. So those are areas that you develop giving a lecture. Um, those are areas of scholarship that you develop as you're doing. So, you, know, you develop the skills of working on very complex theoretical um, uh, 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 domains. And um, 
At the same time, um, when you do a PhD, it's assumed that you have had um, some background in design. You have, at a certain moment, practiced to a certain degree uh, the um, designee and um, that professional practice uh, that um, addressing practical problems and um, in the domain of design gives you the know-how of designing. So this is a range of areas um, to, from a domain expertise in design, uh, developing an academic oriented career or industry oriented career. Um, you are bringing the scholarship and the know-how of designing all that together. If you think about an academic oriented career, you probably, you're gonna take several of those um, uh, learnings and attributes such as scholarships, your background and expertise in design, and you're gonna bundle that with your expertise in leadership, uh, 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 expertise in leadership and entrepreneurship, and apply that into your uh, university career. So you're gonna have to apply for grants, you're gonna develop research labs, you develop partnerships, you're gonna have to write papers, you're gonna get promoted, you're gonna develop courses, you're gonna give lectures. Those are the, um, the application of leadership and entrepreneurship in the academic setting that you're gonna be developing. But you can also think about the opposite. You can also think about that the primary driver of your next um, career uh, move after the PhD is to take the leadership and entrepreneurship skill sets and bring that into the industry. And on the top of that, be able to bring your professional experience from the past, as well as now your new uh, abilities on scholarship, that you understand design more broadly, you can uh, deal with more complex issues in the practice of design, and you can understand more advanced and complex um, um, uh, theoretical uh, problems um, and, and discussions, and apply that into the industry. Let me give you a concrete example. And um, I previously, um, in purpose, presented Jay Malikan as an example of a practical problem, um, because I wanted to uh, bring back his case because um, Jay Malikan was someone that joined the Institute of Design for doing a PhD in 1995. Uh, the PhD degree started in 1994, officially. So there are um, uh, master's students in the past that have done a PhD and was granted a PhD, but officially um, the accreditation degree started in 93 and 90. Uh, for the official, the first, the first time that we accepted PhD students. And 95, Jay Malikan joined the PhD. Um, and he graduated in 2000. So he was the, the second to enter the PhD and also the second to uh, finish uh, the PhD. Um, keep in mind that the PhD in design at the Institute of Design is the first one in the United States. So you're talking about Jay Malikan is the second uh, PhD student to enter, uh, the second student to enter a PhD in design in the United States, and the second one to graduate uh, from that uh, program. And here's this, his dissertation, uh, describing user-centered uh, designing, how design teams apply user research data in creative problem solving. If you look at this, this uh, bio description here, this is a description of his bio that um, came out in December of 2013. So keep in mind that he um, entered 1995, the program, 2000, he graduated, and 2013, um, a report from the Light Center for the Edge and Maker Media, uh, from the Maker Impact Summit. So this was a summit about the uh, uh, maker movement organized by the consulting company Delight. And they um, describe it, they, they describe it Jim Alican as the maker czar 
Intel Labs uh, interaction and experience research group. Jay leads a team of experienced designers who work at the intersection of technology, innovation, and emerging social practice to synthesize and articulate guiding visions of the future of computing. In this previous, in his, uh, in this pro previous professional lives, he has worked as design ethnographer in Dell's uh, digital home group at Microsoft as user researcher and at a variety of other companies as usability analyst, analyst, interaction designer, and product strategy consultant. Jay has lectured on the adjunct faculty at the Illinois Institute of Technology, IIT, and at the Interaction Design Institute in Ivrea, Italy. So let me quickly deconstruct uh, this bio, that uh, short bio from Jay Malikan from 2013. So this is 13 years after he graduated from uh, his PhD. And um, this um, is uh, 13, yeah. And you can see here that maker Kizar, Kizar is a term that uh, people here in the United States give to someone that is given uh, the leadership role and the entrepreneur um, uh, for leading something new. So it's more of an entrepreneurship that, and he was the maker, he was the maker czar for Intel Labs. So he was working at Intel Labs, developing the Arduino boards, working with the maker movements to be able to um, launch this uh, big movement uh, uh, of the make, uh, move, uh, maker movement. Uh, through um, Intel. So Intel being a core partner with a maker movement in this uh, 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 new initiative. So this is um, an entrepreneurship. He has to develop this entire new um, um, uh, project. Um, you can see that there is a description that talks about the leads a team. This notion of leading a team comes to the leadership. He worked at the intersection so this is the scholarship, uh, highly related to the work that you have done. It describes about professional lives that he had. It, this is the know-how, the previous work that he has done before he joined the PhD and uh, work it um, and um, uh, his career. And you can see that the lecture is the domain expertise. So this is just an example of someone that um, after 13 years of a PhD, uh, was um, uh, putting into practice um, all the um, skill set that he's developed and applying that in the domain expertise that he developed. So to conclude here, because I'd like to have opportunity to have a question and answer and interact with the audience, um, what it means to have a PhD in design I just want to show and um, open up the, the perspective that it means a plurality of career paths and opportunities for impact. You can think about multiple career paths, but you also can think about the, that those career paths can lead you to multiple opportunities for making an impact by the skill set that you develop as well as the domain expertise that you develop. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me, and I open for uh, questions and um, an interesting discussion with the audience. Uh, thanks, Carlos. I don't know you actually create a framework to illustrate the career path for the PhD uh, in design. That is interesting. So. I have one, actually one question. So you identified uh, one is academic domain, another is industry domain, and it's not only about A or B, it's also kind of you can transfer from A to B, or B to A, right, like that. So how about uh, your PhD student in the IIT now? So most of them are in the academic domain, or some of them may also go to the industry domain or some balance? 
This, um, we have uh, 30 years of a design uh, program now. And um, uh, yeah, from almost 30 years, I'm sorry, uh, 28 to, and um, this, this varies depending on certain phases. So uh, what I'm saying, for example, is that um, there was a period in the beginning of the PhD where there was a lot of international students coming to do the PhD funded by their government. And the idea was that they were um, uh, get the PhD because it was a new program in the United States and they would go back to their own country and develop the, uh, the, the masters and PhD programs in design based on uh, the training that they had. So we had um, traditionally uh, um, a 60% ratio of people doing PhD and going to academic life and 40% going into the industry. But I would say that right now, um, there is um, less opportunities in the, in the universities and there are increasing opportunities in the industry, looking for people with very advanced uh, skill sets, being able to handle and deal with very complex issues. And, um, and, uh, and they are looking for a lot of those uh, talents and those uh, experts that can help on them. So right now I would say that the new um, cohort of students, they are much more industry oriented. They take summer jobs, they work as, as consultants, interns, and they are interested in developing projects, research projects that are much more on the practical side than on the theoretical side. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to know whether we have any questions from the audience. Uh, we have my colleagues and also our PhD student from our university here. Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, yes. I think I, I totally agree and it sounds logical to me that you um, could develop through PhD, you could develop these three things, right? Entrepreneurship, leadership and scholarship. But I would say that at least in Hong Kong, but also what I see from other universities is that the PhD curriculum is very much focused on the scholarship part, right? The class that we have are mostly on, on research methods and developing yeah, more theoretical academic skills. Would you say in order to make PhDs more suitable or make the transition into practice later more easy it would be it would make sense to focus also more on practical skills in the education or is it exactly these scholarly skills that are um, interesting for uh, for industry i um, i totally agree with you and um, as a director of a phd program uh, one of the things that i've been working is exactly to um, acknowledge that most of the PhDs, and this is almost like a revision after 30 years, I think that um, historically the field, and I'm talking from being uh, part of the first generation of people that did the PhD in the United States, and now being a faculty and the director of the program, is that um, uh, we needed to build legitimacy. So the focus was all primary on scholarship because uh, we, we, we needed to build legitimacy around the PhD degree in design. But um, as we are starting to mature, having 30 years of doing that, um, that legitimacy is already there. And I think that there is now the opportunity to build up on other areas. And so I totally agree with you that still most of the PhDs, if not all of them, primary focus on the scholarship, but uh, part of my presentation today is not only to um, talk to the PhD students about uh, that potential career path, but it's also a call for all the directors of, of PhD programs and, um, and many others that work in that area for us to start uh, working more towards uh, building those other skills. And um, it needs to be very specific uh, around um, the area of scholarship, meaning um, applying for grants, 
that's uh, something that we need to, to work more and encourage more. Um, uh, put, uh, creating positions where PhD students can lead research. So um, it's not just uh, training skills, it's not like uh, basic skills that you're training and focus the PhD in just education and training because that's not the goal. A PhD is a research oriented uh, degree. Uh, but um, we need to develop those skills within the context of doing scholarships. So I think that, um, and those things don't, don't, don't come natural. They need to be developed and they need to be nurtured. So I think there is a lot of work to be done there. Um, and I think this is the next, uh, next movement that needs to happen in PhD degrees in design. You got your answer? Yes, great. I totally agree with this. I think it's also the current context, which is quite different from the 30 years ago. So now we're talking more dynamic uncertainty. I think when we emphasize the scholarship, actually we also offer kind of the flexibility for the career, career path for the PhD student, right? Yeah. Oh, we have the more questions. Yeah. Hello, Professor. Thank you for the presentation. I had um, a question. Usually, in my opinion, researchers are by passion very curious and they always like exploring more. In other words, they also like exploring, um, understanding more than, they, than what they know. So they try to develop more skills and hence more domains. So my question is, is domain like the only end goal in your framework? And also, what are the opportunities for developing multiple domains? Um. I agree with your initial statement of what uh, PhD, uh, that they are curious, they are, they are very exploratory and so forth. So I, I totally agree with that. You have to be a little bit crazy and highly motivated and very passionate about something to be able to, to, to navigate the entire PhD. So this is um, totally true. What I'm, um, what I have some hesitation is to think that you can do a PhD in multiple domains, or you can cross multiple domains easily while you're doing the PhD. Uh, a PhD um, is in a certain domain. You might fi find some hybrid new domains, you might develop in new areas, and this is totally fine, but um, you, you cannot be an expert in two very different domains. You cannot be just an expert in um, the example that I gave about Jay Malikan and talk up and be an expert on, um, um, let's say, um, user um, on um, artificial intelligence at the same time, okay? So those are um, uh, two different areas. And um, it's hard for uh, in four years uh, for anyone to develop a full domain expertise. That said, there is a difference between um, someone that wants to develop um, expertise across um, uh, more than one domain and doing a PhD is just one domain. Well, what I mean is that the PhD, uh, because of the duration and um, because of the uh, beginning of the scholarship of uh, students um, is something that they would have to at least uh, complete an expertise uh, in a domain. Through their career, they probably gonna expand that. So what um, the PhD gives you is exactly the skill set and um, expertise and the foundation where you can explore multiple areas beyond that. And that goes for your research um, life and for your multiple, if you're in academic life, that would consist of how you evaluate it as an assistant professor, as an associate professor, as a professor, is how, how far you can go and take all the work that you're doing. Usually the, P, the PhD research is a lifelong research. You do for life the same thing, but uh, for a PhD to be concluded, you have to have boundaries and you have to be um, something that has limitations. So um, I, uh, I'm hesitant to think about a PhD that cross uh, multiple domains or try to tackle more than uh, uh, one. And, but I'm totally uh, uh, fine with the idea that 
is going to be the domain at the intersection of two different domains. That, that's totally valid, but it needs to go deep. Yeah, thanks. Um, let me pick up the one question from the online audience. Uh, Dr. Tessera, I have seen, especially in the US context, things of design colleagues that have PhDs in art, education, technology, anthropography, material cultural and architecture. Do you find this polarity a strength or weakness for the future impact of design field? What particular trouble do you find it creates for PhD students hoping to connect to others in this field? I think it's quite a challenging question, right? Very challenging question and very, um, very appropriate. Um, I, I'm someone that don't, don't believe too much on being too territorial, that um, we need everybody to have a PhD in design so they can be dean in, in the school of design. I, uh, the same thing would uh, to say that just because you have a PhD in design, you cannot be um, a dean in an architecture school. I, or, or, or in a um, human computer interaction school. So I don't think that uh, we need to be kind of bounded by those uh, artificial boundaries of domains uh, and expertise. What I would say is that uh, for me, what troubles me is not this diversity. Actually, I praise that diversity and I think it's very healthy and very appropriate. Anyone that has a PhD, um, has gone through the very, very rigorous training um, of scholarship, leadership, entrepreneurship, and so forth. They might not have the, the design expertise, um, and, um, and that's, that's fine. What troubles me is not about the plurality and the diversity, it is the very small quantity of PhD degrees that we have in the United States. So in those 30 years, if you really take a PhD in design, there are many PhDs that are related to design in engineering and architecture and many other fields. But in design, I would say that basically you have a PhD that from Carnegie Mellon and from the Institute of Design. Um, and I, I'm using a very strict definition of design here and trying to use a very um, kind of um, uh, limited notion of design, but um, to show that PhD in what you're asking to say, um, oh, we need a PhD in design to be able to lead um, uh, uh, the, the schools and colleges in design, you're not gonna find, because um, you're not gonna have enough of people like that. So this diversity is very good and very appropriate and um, I just would claim that um, if we want to have a bigger voice and more uh, impact in this plurality of voices, um, designers, uh, the school of designs need to build research programs. They need to build PhD programs. So one of the things that I pray every single day um, here when I uh, go to my school and start the day for the PhD is that other schools would also start PhD programs so we can have a critical mass and not be just an island of few people that has this degree. Yeah, thanks Carol, thanks for wonderful speech and also the interesting Q&A. I think that for the graduate consortium, our purpose is not just for the PhD student present their work or master student present their work. It's more like to trigger the discussion and establish a kind of the network. I cannot finish all the, ask all the questions from the online and also our physical audience here. But what I suggest all the actually interesting discussion we can continue through the Discord. So you can go back to the Discord and you can have those further conversation there. Now we have to move on. So before that, I want to say thank you, Carlos, and thanks to, to give this wonderful talk. And um, yeah, we can t keep the discussion. Uh, please join our Discord, which actually a conversation platform based on for this ISDR conference. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.